Hello class and thank you for joining me for chapter 5. We are going to be talking about multiple intelligence theory which is an application in the early childhood education classroom. This theory is based on Howard Gardner. He's one of my favorite, favorite um, theorists. And I think after we finish this chapter you will definitely see why. So let's start with some starting questions with chapter five. Um, your little quote comes actually in your book from Howard Gardner and it says, it's not how smart you are, it's how you are smart. Isn't that a neat phrase? So how do you solve problems? everybody's different we're all different consider how you approach <clears throat> solving <coughs> excuse me challenging situations or problems like being lost or stuck on a classwork problem some people talk themselves through the situations while others need to map out a strategy on paper or make a list we are all different human beings. We have different DNA. We have different makeups. We like different things. Um, still others need to take, you know, that deep breath and center themselves before they can actually tackle a problem. So try and identify some methods that you use to help you through these kinds of situations. Take a minute and just jot those down here. And I guarantee you that between you and I, we're totally different. I mean, when I go to sit down and think about a problem that I'm going to work through, I'm one of those I just have to take that deep breath, center myself, and think before I open my mouth. Because sometimes my mouth just goes, blah, 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 blah. and it is just not a good practice to do that. So why do you seek to identify many ways of thinking, knowing, and representing? Because we are all different. And because we learn different. And Howard Gardner is so realistic when he says, it's not how smart you are. It's how you are smart. Um, don't forget that statement because that is the essence of the multiple intelligence theory. So multiple intelligence theory beginnings, they are concerned with students whose needs were not being met by traditional school methods, models, that emphasized verbal and logical thinking. <coughs> Howard Gardner explored these differences in thought processing. Gardner sought to explain intelligence more thoroughly and broadly through a standardized test score. He wanted to understand why children and their learning styles, if we approach them in a different manner, could they learn more than if we did it traditional. Now, the key here is that traditional, because traditional in education means, if you say, uh, that school is a traditional school, then that school is based on reading, writing, and math are the core components of that traditional school. And their traditional values mean that you constantly sit down and write and learn and the teacher is in charge of your learning and the teacher lectures in front of you and you listen and you learn. That's traditional model. Okay? Howard Gardner said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. There are kids out there that cannot learn like that. So we need to explore and explain what intelligence means. <clears throat> So he sought to redefine what that intelligence means. So his work focused on individuals culturally, 
relevant processes of solving and creating problems, ideas, and tools. Now, this is very different from what a lot of people are saying because when he chose to sit out to redefine that definition of intelligence, can you imagine everybody in education and what they thought about him? He said more than talent, multiple intelligence is about our use of certain methods of thinking and representing what we're thinking. He said children may use one kind of smart to understand concepts in another intelligent area. So in other words, if a child is gifted in what he called the smart of music, then we went through music to get to a reading for them to understand that concept. Can you only imagine what people thought about him? Within a framework of many equally valued ways of thinking, every child is capable of being smart. Now, quote, we are putting that being smart because that's how he defines each intelligence, is by smart. You say multiple intelligence, smart, and we'll talk about what that means. You'll understand that in just a minute, but just remember, kind of smart is a phrase. So the intelligence chart that he came up with looks like this. He says basically there are eight intelligent types and you see that on the left hand of your screen. We have four listed. There's four coming up in a few minutes, but let's talk about the first four. The first one is verbal linguistic word smart and that is a person or a child who is well developed in their language skills and their, their sensitivity to the sound of words meaning and the rhythm of words it's like poetry like songs that bring out that poetry and children can learn things by that now the next is that logical mathematical number smart where children have this ability to think abstractly in concepts and to discern numerical patterns now you can obviously already see 50-50 here, people who are right-brained and left-brained. That right-brained person is going to be more verbal and musical and, and where that left-brained person is going to be logical and mathematical and number smart. So you already see the difference here between pretty much girls and boys. Because if I were to paint a broad stroke, I would say pretty much all boys are are left brains and pretty much all girls are right brain but that's a broad stroke sometimes girls are left brain as well and boys are right brain so we can't really paint a broad stroke like that but we can say that predominantly girls are right brain and predominantly boys are left brain but look at this next one you know it makes sense if you were just in this traditional school oh yeah people are word smart they're number smart. But let's start adding some abstract stuff into this, um, Gardner said. He said, musical, math, math, music, smart. Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Sorry. Which is an appreciation for the ability to produce rhythm, pitch, and tone quality. These children learn through music. They might even have to have music on in the background for their brains to really engage in that learning process. And then he adds this art smart, this visual spatial thinking in pictures or images or the ability to visualize abstractly. I'll never forget, as I was growing up, my dad, he was a builder. And so, um, from the time I was you know, a baby, six weeks old, and born, till I was 18, I lived in 21 different houses 
But I will tell you, I never changed schools or school systems. Um, because my dad built in the Frankfurt area. And so we lived, always lived on the west side of Frankfurt. And that's where he built all of his houses. So we would build a new house and he would showcase it and then we would sell it and then we would build a new house and and he did this but he not only built one house at a time he built several houses but we would move into a showcase house and um but when he got ready to build a house we would go to this piece of property and together with my mom he he would they would stand there and visually picture what kind of house went on that piece of property due to the way the land sloped or whatever. Would it have a basement? Would it be better if it was by level? Would it be two-story, one-story ranch? What would it be? And they had this this spatial or visual art smart to them where they could visualize this and my brother and I would just stand there in amazement and watch. And so we began to learn how to picture pictures in our mind abstractly, you know, and that was a taught behavior, a taught intelligence. Okay, here we go with four more. So there's a total of eight. The next one is this body kinesthetic, body smart, the ability to use and control one's movement or a sensitivity to handling and manipulating objects such as puzzles, those types of things. And they usually have really good gross motor skills and they have to groove and move. Um, and you and and if you um, make them sit in a chair, the poor little things cannot they can't handle it because their body is constantly moving and they have to manipulate things. So we have to be very sensitive to that as a learner. Gardner also said that some people just have that people smart, that interpersonal awareness and sensitivity to moods and motivations of others. I have that. Um, where I'm not really a kinesthetic person. I don't really have to move and groove and do those types of things. And then there's that intrapersonal, a self-awareness and connection with one's own feelings and thought processes. You know, um, <clears throat> and I think this is an excellent smart to have. And lastly, you have the naturalist the nature smart, and appreciation and ability for recognizing and sorting things in nature. Okay, let's put all this together. What in the world is he talking about? Let's get a little bit, go through the, the eight um, intelligence again. We're going to get very defined in each one of them. <clears throat> Verbal linguistic, which was the number one that I told you about, pretty much a right brained person they are well developed in their language skills you you will start to see them as babies they will actually say their words faster than others um, and as they move into their two-year-olds they are connecting things and making sentences with them and you can quickly tell a child <clears throat> by two if they are verbal and very linguistic they have an aptitude in listening, reading, speaking, and writing. That means they are very high leveled in those. They, they engage themselves quite um, well. They enjoy stories. They enjoy poems. <clears throat> um, they, they love to listen to all different types of things through, through different devices. Their classroom activities, you're gonna the sound discrimination. They're gonna want to, they're gonna want to hear things in the background because they're very sensitive to that. Sharing literature, dictating stories, actually sitting down with those kind of children and 
and writing out what they are saying and talking about when they draw pictures, those types of things, they're going to enjoy those and they're going to learn from those. They really like to dialogue in classroom. They love storytelling time. Um, the imagination part of them is extremely um, noticeable because they enjoy that. Logical and mathematical children are a little bit different. They have the strong ability in problem solving, calculations, and number relations ships. They're familiar with concepts of quarterly time, cause and effect. They can see patterns in numbers. They're very good at patterns. You'll be able to tell their pattern orientation when you um, see them in their toddler room and they'll start lining um, their little cars up orange, yellow, orange, yellow. You'll begin to see those patterns start coming out in their play. Um, and you'll think, is that just a coincidence? No, it's not. It just happens with them sometimes because they can visually see that in their heads very fast. They enjoy prediction. They enjoy, just like those two little boys that were placing their hands under the um, dryer and pulling them out that cause and effect there. They really like predicting, is that going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Um, their classroom activities need to include measuring, counting, cooking. Um, they really like the sand tables, the art tables, those types of things because they want predicting outcomes and solution. Pouring the sand into a funnel means that it's going to come out in a slower process at the bottom because the top is bigger and the bottom is smaller. You know, what's going to happen if I, in a water table, if I dam the water up down here and then I just let a little bit come through? What's going to happen? Or what if I take out the whole dam and the water goes shh? See, they enjoy those types of things. They enjoy joy identifying creating patterns with blocks they love blocks lego blocks stacking blocks wooden blocks hollow blocks any of those blocks that the star rating system is telling you to put in your room these are for those logical and mathematical kids next we have musical kids they have this innate ability to make music with patterns and rhythm and sounds and tones. I'll never forget when I went to Jamaica. I was actually on a mission trip and um, it was so amazing how Jamaicans use their mouth to make noises. They talk with those rhythms and sounds and even the tone and the pattern and it's taught and they do it all with their mouth it's kind of like people who rap they have that pattern rhythm sound tone all moving at the same time but this was very unique I noticed it in the children because they constantly sit there and they did the drum things like this all the time while we were sitting standing there trying to teach them and it, even though it annoyed us as people we understood that that's the way that they actually lived because all of them did it um, but we were on a bus going up this huge mountain called Goat Mountain now you can only imagine why it was called Goat Mountain because as we were going up the road kept getting narrower and narrower and narrower and it was on a mountain and when you looked up the side of the van guess what you saw just a total rock hill all the way down well dump trucks would come down and dump trucks would go up cars would go up cars would come down how in the world did they know who was coming down and who was going up? Well, I finally figured it out. It was through the, they used their horns. And the person who was the strongest 
was the person who got to go completely all the way through. If somebody else disregarded that, they backed either all the way back up or all the way back down. Interesting. Music has an emotional connection to it. We all know that. If there are certain types of music that make you go to sleep, there are certain types of music that hype you up. Um, <clears throat> so there is an emotional connection there to music with these with these people. They enjoy listening to and making music and songs. And songs move them. They move them to emotions. They move them in connecting with themselves. The true true feel your their true feelings. So what classroom activities do you give to these musical people? Well first of all you use rhythms and um, songs for transitional time because these kids are gonna they're gonna go with the flow. They're, when they hear those patterns, those rhythms, those sounds, those tones, they're they're gonna immediately emotional connect to it and buddy they're gonna be right there with you. <clears throat> they um, music can be used in active listening exercises in the classroom so that you understand or the kids understand um, what's going to happen happen next and when they hear those words as you're singing them they will remember them because they make an emotional connection. Their brain actually connects with that music. Encourage children to create instruments of their own and have original musical works like their own songs um, because these children that have this ability, they have the ability to do that. Um, it's very interesting if you had had the opportunity to go to Henderson, Kentucky when um, the language, the 101 languages of children were there. Um, and this, that particular theory actually comes from a little town in Italy and we, we will talk about Reggio Emilia later on. But the 101 languages is based on the theory of Reggio Emilia. And in Reggio Emilia, <clears throat> um, one of the things that they showed us in this exhibit was that these children, they would, they would go in to this big concrete um, room that had these huge pillars and the room was not it wasn't complete like it was it didn't have paint on the walls didn't have tile on the floor it was just a room that in a building that was being built and they took these children in there and and they hung these big pipes of just made out of different types of material such as um, the plastic tubes or wooden tubes and they just hung them from the ceiling and so the children could actually like a wind chop they would move them back and forth well then the children began to understand because of the echo in the room because of the concrete that the sounds as they would move these things back and forth, one over here with the wood, one over here with the plastic, and they would move move these things back and forth. They would they would make different sounds, and they created not only their instruments of, but they would put these different tones and different rhythms and different patterns all together with these same um, wind chimey looking instruments that were larger three or four times larger than they were because they were like eight foot tall and then you can only imagine a four-year-old 
or a three-year-old up against an eight-foot pipe and you can move it back and forth to make these sounds. It's very interesting. It's called Reggio Amelia. We'll talk about that later. But it kind of goes with this musical smart. And again, this brings up this next part where they replicate sounds heard in nature. Um, children, if they have that ear, birds singing, you know, um, dogs barking, whatever intrigues them. So, the wind blowing. These are all of what we call aesthetic experiences and we allow that process to engage children so that they take it in and begin to learn within their element. Visual and spatial, we talked a little bit about that. By the ability to use pictures and visuals to tell stories, convey information and art and actually seeing that abstract, creating that image in the mind and actually putting putting it on um, a piece of paper, a land, taking it out of their mind, but cre actually, it's actually created within their vision. They have a strong sense of direction, ability to adeptly move around in complex paths. So they like, um, I'm thinking like complex paths, you know, would be anything like um, the corn mazes. That's what I was trying to think of, the corn maze. They really like those kinds of things and they can find their ways around them very easily. So their classroom activities would be guiding their, Im their imagery, imagination, games, of course, anything that's, that's in their head that can come out. Maps, puzzles, blocks, treasure hunts, um, murals, 3D, 2D art, storyboards. You're going to hear them tell all kinds of stories. And then you have this kinesthetic people that move. They're sensory learners. They enjoy touching, manipulating, moving, handcrafting. They're fast. They have the ability to use their body skillfully and gracefully to explore ideas and learn about. Like I said, they have great gross motor skills. Their activities are obstacle courses, large motor skills, um, sensory projects, touching and exploring, dance, pantomime, acting, and dramatic play. You're going to see them act out in dramatic play, all kinds of things. Um, manipulatives and sculpting. This interpersonal, the outward one, um, has the ability to form relationships and navigate social situations, group interactions. They understand feelings and motives of others, and they're very persuasive. Their activities should include active listening exercises, role-playing conflict resolution, show and tell, working in groups on collective projects. They love to work as teams. They are great at group story writing. This inward one, the one that connects to themselves, they are sensitive to their inner personality traits such as motivation, sense of self, personal emotions, their intro perspective, and they're comfortable identifying and expressing their emotions. They don't care if they cry, if they laugh, they are just in tune with their self and they enjoy that. That classroom activity is setting goals, planning activities, reviewing those experiences. They like to journal, write, work independently, identifying and expressing their emotions. They will say, so-and-so is crying. So-and-so is upset. They will be constantly telling you those types of things and you know three and four year olds definitely like to do that. The last is that naturalist enjoys gay engaging. Now when you say naturalist don't just think about going outside outdoorsy type of people. That is part of it but it's not all of it. Listen to this. They enjoy engaging with the environment that they're in. 
So the classroom environment, they enjoy being there. They do enjoy nature. They sort and classify natural items, such as where do birds go, the different types of birds. Is this a sea animal, an ocean animal, or is it a pond animal? You're going to see these types of children being able to classify those. They will recognize categories and classifications of living things very fast and patterns that are among them. Their classroom activities include describing and recording observations using graphs and charts, which is part of math. So you're going to see this naturalist really link into that mathematical um, person who's, who's got that left brain stuff going. They like experiments using binoculars and microscopes. Um, they're going to play doctor a whole lot. The gardening and exploring fossils and nature walks. Um, and they will come up with some of the most incredible ideas. Now here's some considerations for teachers when you are thinking about your classroom. And I will tell you that, you know, Gardner presents these eight smarts or eight multiple intelligence. But the cool part about this is, is that a person doesn't just have to be one of the eight. He could actually be two of the eight, four of the eight, six of the eight, seven out of the eight. Maybe he's eight out of eight. I don't know. So when you're thinking about this in your classroom, you look at your children in this theory and you line them up according to their smarts and then you begin to make the connections in your lesson plans because you want all learners in your classroom to learn and you have to set that your classroom lesson plan up so that you have activities for all eight smarts and all your children. So integrate activities to appeal to all kinds of thinkers. Don't try to label or track children. You just need to realize these are the eight smarts and I need to have eight ways of learning in my classroom. I need to give them a presentation um, and develop all the smarts, and develop all the intelligence so that you hit all kinds of thinkers. And continually reflect, reflect on your own processing style in relation to your teaching style. Who you are is how you teach. <coughs> I'm a very much of a storyteller and I tell stories and I connect try to connect you with those stories I try to um, engage you in that learning process and seeing me as a teacher using my hands being dramatic emphasizing words not being monotone I that's what I'm trying to teach you to do is understand Oh, Miss Maria, when you're talking, I enjoy listening to you. Well, why do you enjoy listening to me? Because I'm a bit dramatic. And a lot of people, especially early childhood people, enjoy that. So who you are is how you teach. Provide ample hands-on experiences focus, focusing on that authentic activities and remember that intelligence is related to usefulness or authenticity so you've got to you've got to give these people experiences and value new unusual or wild ideas and solutions <clears throat> support children's unique thinking preferences while encouraging exploration in all their ways of thinking. You know, if a child is really gifted in music and they're not in numbers, well, we don't want them to not be good at math because what's going to happen when they get to college and they can't do math? They're going to not be able to graduate 
and we want we have to build their weaknesses as well as enabling them to grow in their strengths. Consider interdisciplinary projects. The word interdisciplinary, you are in the interdisciplinary early childhood education program here at some KCTCS school. I just happen to teach from BCTC, which is Bluegrass Community and Technical College. But the Interdisciplinary Early Childhood Education Program is all over the state of Kentucky through KCTCS schools. Interdisciplinary means, the reason we tagged that on there, we could say just early childhood education. But there was a reason that we put interdisciplinary in there is because we believe that when we teach children that we don't just have to teach reading, writing, and math. We can be interdisciplinary. We can teach a lot of ways of thinking through a lot of different subjects. For instance, I can teach language in science. I can teach science in math. I can teach, I can group social studies with language. I could connect um, the block area with language because I have all these interdisciplinary projects moving in my classroom and my centers and I strategically do that to ensure that all children are being taught in my classroom. Teachers guide and facilitate, they coach, they observe, and they reflect. Now, if you take each one of those words and you break those down, they guide. They give positive guidance, not in their words. They use positive words to create positive images in children's brains. They guide their learning by understanding child development and understanding that Piaget says that the children learn on that continuum and so they know that emerging skill that's coming up as the next step and so they guide that children to a higher level of learning. They facilitate the learning by asking questions. They facilitate that learning by providing opportunities in their classroom to grow and know those milestones and they coach because they love, because they enjoy, because they want to see children grow. They observe children to understand where they are on that continuum and they reflect on what they can do in the future and what they have already done in the past, what worked and what did not work. They pose open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are questions that you cannot just say yes or no to. Open-ended questions, for instance, gives the child the opportunity to say a statement that's totally theirs. They own the answer to that. So, okay, a closed-ended question would be this. Do you want a drink of water? Yes or no? No, I don't want to drink water. Yes, I want to drink water. An open-ended question would be, what could we do or what could I give you to drink? Then the child has the choice to make a choice. They can say milk, water, chocolate milk, coke, hopefully not, Mountain Dew they might say. Well, why would you want a Mountain Dew? So they're provoking children to think about making their own choices. 
that's a very good thought to think about. So how, in this theory, how do you assess a multiple intelligent classroom? Well, you're going to have to use portfolios, number one. Portfolios are the primary assessment tool. It allows for a variety of sources and information. It's going to be about the children. You'll see lots of pictures. Um, children can select and reflect on the work that they want in there. It's individualized, personalized documentation. So let's think about some reflection questions here at the end of our lecture. Which intelligent areas do you think you have strengths in? And which are areas you do not feel you are very strong in? That's important for you to reflect on this because in essence, remember we said, you know, teachers teach from who they are. So I am not a mathematical person, nor do I like messes. So, but I love art, but I just don't like all that ooey gooey shaving cream type stuff. I just, I'm not good at it. I don't like it. And I hate the touch of it. Okay. So, just because I don't like something does or I don't feel comfortable teaching something, does that mean the children have to suffer and they can't ever enjoy shaving cream or, or ooey gooey stuff in Miss Maria's room? No, I had to overcome that. I had to understand that I was weak in that area and <clears throat> I made myself do it when I was a four-year-old teacher. As a matter of fact, I made myself do it to the point that I created Fridays to be nothing but that area of intelligence that we worked on. How do you think your specific thinking style might impact your teaching? From a positive standpoint, from a good, from a negative standpoint, reflect both ways. What can you do to ensure that your strengths do not dominate your teaching too much? It's a very good reflection question because we don't want to dominate our children. We want them to dominate their self. That's what we want. Well, thank you for joining me today and I will be talking to you soon. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.